Welcome back. When you think of the most influential and prolific composers of classical music, Bach, Beethoven, and Mozart usually come to mind. Their works dominate our concert halls and also form the foundation for how we interpret and receive classical music. But over the past decade, a growing chorus of voices have expressed concern that these white European classics have a monopoly on our concert halls at the expense of a much wider range of diverse talent. In fact, just this week, an article appeared in The Globe entitled, Move Over Beethoven, It's Time for New Influencers in the Classical Canon. Let's turn to the panel. Perrin, I mean, it's a tough discussion, but you champion a lot of timeless composers. How do you balance this? I think we continue to evolve the art form. Um, those works are popular for a reason, and that's because people have been exposed to them over a long, long period of time, and you get to know the tunes. It makes it more accessible and easy to do. You know, I, I think back to my, me growing up, Andrew Lloyd Webber was a brilliant marketeer. He's not a brilliant composer, in my opinion, but he's a brilliant marketeer. So all of those songs from Evita were released as singles. You got to know the music. You wanted to go and see the show. So it's those kinds of things which make a, a huge, a huge difference, because you get access and you go, oh, I, I'll take that risk. Is there a very audible cry for change such that it would influence your programming choices? Very much so. I, th I think it's absolutely imperative that we listen to people, um, and, and and you know, commissioning of new work is is part of that. But it's also looking at some of the things that have been composed before, um, that ha have just not had had the opportunity to be seen before. You know, um, my old company, Houston Grand Opera, Porgy and Bess hadn't been done for twenty years, and they revisited it, and it became you know a more repertoire piece again, mm -hmm. um, because suddenly people were like, oh my goodness, this is a piece of incredible theatre. It just hadn't been done for. 20 20 years. Mm -hmm. So there are, there are pieces out there that, that can do that. Yeah, there, there, there's good reason that we have these canonical works. And if you think about it, tons of work was being written, and there's this kind of distillation of some pieces, and, and often they're great, great works, and we love them and we see them perennially because they're so great. Um, and, and this is always going to be the challenge with incorporating new work into our programming, into our seasons, is that, you know, there is such a small room for this this new work but also it doesn't necessarily have the lead time to to be refined with such a with such a level and or um, you know for us to make a hundred new operas say or a hundred new orchestral works and say there's you know, three really great ones you know th there's not as a composer as a person writing new work there's an incredible pressure to not fail you do said you, yeah go ahead I, I just, I'm just curious do you find there's a negative perception about new classical music of course, and I think part of what it is is that there is, I mean, that's such a huge category of music, of, of sound worlds. You know, as an indigenous composer, my, you know, there, there are, there's a small but mighty group of, of uh, new music composers in the indigenous community, and we, our sound worlds are so radically different. Some of us, you know, sound maybe like neoclassical, and um, some of us sound neo-impressionistic or romantic, or, you know, dropping coins into a piano. I mean, you have every kind of sound world possible. And so um, it's hard for an audience to know what to expect when they're coming to a new music program. And it comes down to programming. And I think. I think a lot of people are traumatized from that sort of mid 20th century sure. era where the, where academia, yeah. uh, composer academia was super alienating, was like high intellect, interesting sound experiments, but not designed for a listening public. Absolutely. You said not a lot of room. What does that mean? Sort of, is it a one in one out situation? What does that balance look like? Well, one of the things, I mean, there are so few repeat performances of new work. I mean, in new opera especially, often they're sort of one and done. And, you know, millions of dollars could be invested in, in, in creating a new opera and for it to not go on to have a sustained life in, in, in new productions. So there's the huge cost to it. But I think also just within programming, there have been so few slots available within a concert season. Um, for example, in, in symphony orchestras to say, you know, we have the Beethoven, the Mozart, the Bach, the whatever we have within our programming, um, we, we have a, a more of a resistance to including new work. That's changing, and that's certainly changing in some of the large organizations. Likewise, in the ballet, the two most performed ballets in history are Tchaikovsky's The Nutcracker and Swan Lake. Yeah. I mean, you can Both of which me. were unsuccessful when they premiered. <laughs> yes. and, and it took decades for them to become the, the, the chestnuts they are in terms of box office demand. So, so I, I think that's an important thing to reflect on. I mean, we're, I think we are, uh, we live in a sort of a disposable throwaway society where if it didn't work the first time, it's never heard from again. And so I think it's really important for us at the National Ballet, we're really focused on building trust in the brand um, and that 
if you come to the theater to experience something by the National Ballet of Canada, the experience is going to be world class. But we're going to challenge the audience with new work, and sometimes it's going to work well, and sometimes it's going to work less well. But the experience you're going to have in that theater is still going to be, you know, top of the line. And so, um, so it's a balance. It's a it's it's getting audiences to go on a journey with you, um, and then sometimes that journey is going to be a bit of a mystery. Calls to address racial and gender disparities have extended to the stage, Kathleen, mostly because people of color and women are generally underrepresented as composers and performers and so on. Uh, you know, you're a female performer. Um, to what extent do you see this as an issue? And how should practices change to address it? Well, this is, this is interesting because I, I know that before we had spoken about this New York Times article by Anthony Tomasini from a couple of years ago talking about you know, the orchestral audition should remove the screen, which should was, remove the blind audition. Was, yeah, yeah, the in blind order audition. To, exactly. In order to, yeah. Uh, and and what was interesting to me about that is, first of all, this is an American writer writing for an American paper about an American context. And what is different in Canada, the States does not have, is that we have 50 years of official multicultural policy, which has meant that. The expectation is that people who come here or who have backgrounds that are not Western European are going to express themselves through different musics, are going to make music differently. So uh, there has been a lot of funding around different uh, cultural musics. For me, if I'm not seeing all the, the different aspects of our mosaic on stage at Roy Thompson Hall, for me, that is not necessarily a symptom of systemic racism. What might be, though, is the fact that if we worry about that in that context, and we think the worry is really that those people are not being seen on what are considered the most prestigious stages, the issue that this is still an art, this art form is held above all of those others yeah. all this time, still to this day, <clears throat> that's the symptom of systemic racism. There is definitely a concerted effort to highlight more composers, which is without question, I think, the biggest challenge in classical music. It comes down to the composers. When you look at the performers, the people that are on the world stages in uh, great concert halls all around the globe are all young, dynamic, from a multitude of countries of different ethnicities, different backgrounds, different experiences to how they got on that world stage and they're you know, proudly sharing who they are and their stories with all of us, which I think is remarkable. Uh, I think the bigger challenge is, uh, as you kick this off with, is you know, our love for the classic composers, which let's face it, you know, uh, the Beatles aren't going anywhere and neither is Beethoven. <laughs> oh. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. Don't go away. We'll pick this up on the other side. Sorry.